Um, my name's Derek Thompson. I'm the business editor at The Atlantic. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and a real pleasure to be speaking uh, with the governor of Colorado, Governor John Hickenlooper. Um, for those of you who live in Colorado, you probably know a lot of uh, his more uh, eccentric stories. But for those of you from out of state, which I think probably involves quite a, bit, quite a few of you, uh, given the nature of this, uh, this festival, I wanted to list at least four uh, strange and notable facts uh, about the governor of Colorado. The first is that he's a jack of all trades. He was a fired, or I'm sorry, laid off geologist who uh, founded the uh, Weinkoop, a brewing company, uh, one of the only politicians to be both, uh, I think, a fired a geologist and someone who started a brewing company, um, uh, which has sort of helped to revitalize uh, Lodo, uh, the lower part of downtown Denver. Second is he's a showman. Uh, there's two commercials that are uh, particularly notable that I found in my research of the governor. The first is one that he shot uh, jumping out of a commercial airplane uh, when he was the mayor trying to advocate for a referendum to make the argument that Colorado was in free fall. Even though uh, he's reportedly afraid of heights, he took two takes. The other commercial uh, was him taking a shower with all of his clothes on in order to protest Colorado's dirty politics. Uh, and even though taking a shower with all of your clothes on is not advisable, that particular commercial had seven takes. The final uh, <laughs> uh, fact that I wanted to, to say is that he's a compromiser. And not just when he's elected, uh, but when he was, in, when he was running uh, Wine Coop uh, Brewing Company and his brew pub days, he borrowed uh, once 10 pigs from a local farmer. He had them race around the block, and he called this event the running of the pigs. PETA caught wind of this, and they objected. They said that the pigs were being objectified and being made exhausted. And so like any good future politician, what he did was, he did a little uh, Bismarckian uh, politics here. He, the next year, he did the same running of the pigs, but this time he had the audience pet the pigs and feed them and put little cute hats on them and pamper those little porkers. And he called it the pleasuring of the pigs, <laughs> uh, which sounds a little like a metaphor for dealing with any state legislature. And with that, um, <laughs> to our first question. This is just, mostly just, an interview. Just for the record, the, that still didn't satisfy PETA. I read that and, too. and the next year, they were so unhappy that we ended up liberating the pigs and sending them actually to a farm where they could live out their, their years unencumbered by work or threats. Right. <laughs> First question. So Colorado has an unemployment rate under 7%. Boulder and Denver have been listed by the Brookings Institution as two of the most impressive metros uh, in the United States. Uh, and you're one of the 10 richest states by GDP per capita. Uh, what does Colorado have that makes it special? And how have you weathered this recovery better than most states? Well, part of it was over the previous decade, we diversified the economy uh, fairly dramatically. Uh, people think of, you know, mountains and beautiful ski resorts like, like Aspen, but we're the, either by, by how you measure it, either the number one or the number two uh, 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 aerospace industry in the, in the country. We've had a number of what we call advanced manufacturing, reshoring jobs uh, coming back. Uh, so light manufacturing jobs, a lot of advanced technology in those jobs. Uh, but a big part of it is Colorado, and like a lot of places in the country, is a magnet for young people. And there are, you know, in 2009, 2010, 2011, when there were no jobs anywhere, at the bottom of that recession, uh, according to the basic census data, we had more 25 to 34-year-olds moved into metropolitan Denver than any other city in America, not per capita, than any city. And if you were to expand that to a, a statewide basis, I think it would prove out the same uh, there. And as you get these young people who are, in, in many cases, the nerds, the geeks, the, the ones who write code for the internet and, and really drive the economy, uh, when they want to be where you are, you, you attract entrepreneurs and startups. And if you look at, uh, you know, Colorado is ranked either first or second in entrepreneurship and innovation by Inc. Magazine in 2013 by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I mean, th this young energy, uh, obviously, uh, there, I know there are some great experience and talent out there. We need to get you helping these, these young entrepreneurs. But there's just a, a, a real energy about startups. And, and it's, it's a lot of it's in Boulder, but you see it in Colorado Springs. You see it in Fort Collins. You see it all over the state. Durango. Right. I mean, on that point of startups and young entrepreneurs, I feel like at the national level and across the states, there's an obsession right now 
with entrepreneurship <laughs> and startups. True. And you hear it come up in these national policy debates when someone says, should we raise taxes? No, no one's going to start a business if they think about capital gains rates going up. Should we have more regulations for healthcare? No, that's going to slow down startups. As someone who has experience as an entrepreneur, a Democrat, a mayor, a governor, is there something wrong with the national conversation that we're having right now about entrepreneurship and startups? Well, I think there is a, a bias that it, in some ways the, 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 this uh, exaggeration of entrepreneurship that can solve everything has led to almost a distortion of what entrepreneurs need. Really what entrepreneurs need is pretty much what every business needs, right? Less red tape. They need access to capital. Uh, they need talent uh, to be able to hire. They need, you know, the basic foundations of, of a good business environment. But, but they also need, you know, uh, mentorship. They need, uh, you know, uh, access to peers, places where they can connect. Uh, that's one of the advantages. Places like Colorado or San Francisco or Boston, when you've got these in, in, intense uh, congregations of talented young people, you kind of get this almost like a spontaneous combustion. Right. One thing that draws a lot of young people, I think, is this concept of livability. And it's interesting, because as mayor of Denver, you introduced Green Print Denver to improve urban yep. living, to increase the efficiency and, uh, and the environmental stability of, of the city. You know, if we were speaking to the Sierra Club, there'd be no reason to defend that decision from an economic standpoint. But there's a lot of business people, I imagine, in the audience who think that it's not obvious that environmental initiatives are good as a matter of economic policy. So make the case, persuade them. Well, certainly that livability, uh, and it's, it's not just having a, a, an outdoor recreational environment that attracts all these young people, it attracts a lot of people, right? I'm gonna guess there's some of the people in this audience that are residents here, or were attracted for those very reasons. Uh, you also have livability aspects, uh, health. I think that's gonna be, we are and have been for a number of years, the thinnest state in America, not because we're so smart or so such wise eaters or have more discipline mm -hmm. because all these young people who are thin and a attracted to skiing, hiking, biking, this is where they want to be. And so they bring our average down. It, now, if you actually look at the statistics, it's not that hard for us to make the leap to become the healthiest state in America, right? We've got images like uh, we have, a, we're very, it's an athlete. Who is the healthiest state? Uh, it depends on how you measure it, okay. and, there, and there are several uh, in competing, but the uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Massachusetts is pretty healthy. Oh, but we, we have high uh, uh, rates of uh, uh, prescription drug abuse is one example. We can fix that, right? And if we're, over the next three years, we're going to really focus to take us from being the thinnest state to being, without argument, the healthiest state. Now that becomes, if, uh, if you're an entrepreneur and you're the healthiest state there, uh, you know, if you are readily acknowledged as the healthiest state, that's something that, and this is having talked to hundreds of an entre entrepreneurs, having been an entrepreneur, this is something that they respond to. Same with a good education system. It's not all about compensation and beautiful mountains. That They also want some of the basic building blocks. If they're going to build a business, they're also going to build a family and build a life. Right. When you're talking about attracting talent, to a certain extent, is this a psychological game? Are you trying to get places like Denver and Boulder to be top of mind when smart 22, 23-year-old software engineers are thinking, all right, where do I go? There's Silicon Valley. There's Boston. There's Silicon Alley. New York's sort of hot. There's the Tumblr purchase. That has something to do with it. There's New Orleans, which is all these new initiatives and is an incredibly cheap place to live not to mention fun, um, <laughs> uh, reportedly. Um, it, you, I mean, so is, is this a part of it, just getting, getting your, your top cities top of mind for, for these graduating students? Well, it, it, there is a level of branding. And, you know, when, we, when I first got elected, we did a, what we call the bottom-up economic development plan. So we went out and we talked to every this is county. This Denver? No, this is Governor. Oh, okay. So this is two and a half years ago, and we spent six months going to all 64 counties and asking the county commissioners, the economic development folks, what's your vision for your county? What do you want to see happen? What matters most? And we found some basic, obviously they wanted us to attract and retain businesses better, but they also uh, get, make government more responsive, get rid of the red tape. They wanted access to capital. They wanted training. Of course, you do all those things. They also really wanted to push uh, innovation. Uh, and all of these things we've tried to to respond to, but the last thing they, they, they wanted was they wanted a better job of branding the state of Colorado. Uh, and about a year ago, we hired a young guy, um, and uh, Aaron Kennedy was a, on Madison Avenue, top advertising guy, just couldn't find a, loved pasta, couldn't find fast, good pasta, so he started Noodles and Company. 
a number of years ago, built it up to about 200 stores and sold it, and retired to this beautiful little farm outside Boulder, and he was happy. I don't know how old he is. He's not much over 40, um, but didn't have to work. And I have this little program where I try to attract CEOs or former CEOs to come, and once a quarter they have, there are 12 of us, and we have lunch. Uh, it's called, we call it the, le the Leadership Initiative, but it's to convince people that they've got to give some time to public service. It's sometime before they're 70, they agree to spend two years in public service. Uh, and uh, uh, Jeff Smart is the guy who helped actually put this together. He wrote the book Leadocracy, Leadocracy about this. Uh, anyway, so uh, Aaron Kennedy was there, and he said, oh, I was talking about the importance of branding and how this whole state had wanted this to happen. He said, I love that. That sounds right up my alley. I'm, and so we are now... He took a minor pay cut. I think we're paying about $60,000 a year. Uh, and he is leading a statewide process where it's kind of a, uh, a crowdsourcing, but also he's hired some of the top people and companies. But we're not hiring some consultant from New York or from San Francisco. We're doing this with all talent in, in Colorado. And a lot of that branding is about innovation and about entrepreneurship. And the same kinds of people that would be attracted to come to Aspen or Vail or Steamboat Springs or Crested Butte for a, a ski vacation or a summer vacation are the same people that control whether their company's going to open a new office somewhere or the same people that are going to start a business. So right. uh, we're really trying to leverage that into the brand. And he's, uh, you know, we're going to roll this out in the end of August. It's, it's going to be pretty good. Right. Well, the name uh, Hickenlooper uh, <laughs> opens you up to a lot of nicknames. Uh, and one of them is uh, Frackenlooper uh, in reference to the fact that your scene is cozying up uh, to natural gas more than some of your predecessors. And it's interesting because in a, in a serious way, Colorado's a crucible of the national debate about energy. You have some staunch environmentalists. You have these shales. You have this serious interest to jumpstart, uh, you know, these mining and construction businesses from uh, uh, from from fracking. How do you balance these competing interests to help your state's economy while protecting the environment? Well, first, you know, the, the fracking looper. I mean, if you grow up and you're a little kid and you've been called. Uh, Chicken Cooper <laughs> and 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 Poop and Scooper. And, I mean, th they've got a ways to go. Um, I, I do think that that the the that there is a, an all of the above approach that we've tried to take here and, and say, all right, we want to make sure we have cleaner air. We recognize that we have a, a significant part of the state's economy is based on the the wonders of our landscapes and and clean air and clean water. We also recognize that this country needs a lot of energy, just as the world does, and that I think we've got a legitimate chance by the end of this decade to be energy independent, to be a net exporter. And what our job is to say, all right, if we're going to use natural gas in, in automobiles, right, and I'm a, a big supporter of that, I think that's a, a legitimate effort. It, it limits the amount of oil that's imported, which I think makes the world politically more stable. It certainly helps our balance of pay payments. What will it take that we can get these, the, the, the gas wells done and the fracking done where it's absolutely safely, done safely, where we don't have methane escapes, where we, the, the oil and gas companies agree to be transparent about what's in a frac fluid, uh, that we have, we increase the fines, uh, we increase the setbacks. You know, we've pushed the setbacks now if they're trying to drill a well that's close to a school or a place of congregation, uh, it's a thousand feet. Right? We moved all the setbacks from 350 to 500. And you know, out west, it's a split of state. Right? The, the person who owns the mineral rights underground is different, generally, than the person who owns the surface. And what that means is you've got some woman who's retired in, in Dubuque, Iowa, and for 20 years, she's owned the mineral rights under this, this property. Uh, and in our state constitution, it guarantees the, the, the right of access to those people that own the mineral rights. So we've got two issues. One's a land use planning issue where these wells with, with you know, uh, these new technologies are, are coming closer to communities, and I, I don't blame the communities for being upset, and th that's a, a clear issue that every county and, er uh, and every community has to, has to wrestle with, but our Constitution guarantees people the right to access this. So my job, I think, is to say, all right, if they're going to be accessed, how can we make, we make that as least intrusive? And we've had a couple of communities where they wanted to ban fracking altogether, and that's, they tried to ban oil and, well, oil and gas exploration in other places previously, and our Supreme Court has, without fail, always struck it down. So the question is, you can't ban it, but we have allowed communities to work out relationships with the oil and gas companies to really dramatically modify how they ex explore. And I think with great success in some of the most beautiful parts of the state, the community feels, yeah, if, th if these companies will abide by 
our our joint operating agreement, uh, th- then th- we can go forward. Right. Well, one thing that clearly drives the economics of states is education, and it's been very difficult for states, especially at a time of recession, tax revenues are low, um, and the stimulus, the federal stimulus has been winding down now for, for three years. Um, you know, since the recession, states have cut their budgets, and one casualty of that has been education budgets, higher education. And when you cut funding to education, those schools have to raise tuition. And we already know that tuition costs are extremely high and student debt is a problem. Um, how, how do you deal with this? When you're, you, you have a responsibility to balance your budget, you have a responsibility to make Colorado competitive in, in terms of higher education. Um, if not cutting an education, where? How do you solve that problem? Well, it's been, it has been a challenge, not just for Colorado, but as you say, all across the country. And uh, it's not one that has an easy solution. We have tried to bring, when I was mayor of Denver, we, we got, there's a fellow there named Tim Marcus who started a company called Venico. Uh, if you're good at buying and selling beer, you can make some, a pretty good living. He's good at buying and selling oil fields and is very successful, mostly on the, on the West Coast. And is a very generous, he's one of these people that's not leaving his money to his kids. He's, he's going to give it all, he and his wife are going to give it all away in their lifetime. So they got to start before he even turned 50. He gave a $50 million gift to the, to the Denver Scholarship Foundation, which allows Denver to say, all right, if your family, you know, we can go into third grade classrooms and say, if your family doesn't have the money, that doesn't matter. If you're willing to work hard enough, we guarantee you the money to be able to go to college. And one of the big issues about rising tuition is access, right? A lot of people, I'm going to guess many of the people in this room, your kids or your grandkids are going to, to college and the tuition goes up. You don't like it. It's not good. But, but you will, you'll be able to survive and your kid will still get an education. The risk is, is, is A, access, and B, huge debts that these kids come out of school and they've leveraged their future. It makes them vulnerable to all kinds of, of I think, bad decisions. So we are aggressively looking at how can we make sure that we get more scholarship resources. We have a great deal already, but expand that from just the city and county of Denver to the entire state. We're also trying to figure out how to, I mean, this is an issue we face in the whole, in the whole country. The, the economic incentive is skewed. And, and by this I mean, here we are, the most educated, we're the, either the first or the second most educated state in the country, and yet we're struggling so the, the kids coming out of our public schools and going to the, the, our universities need a great deal of remediation. A lot of them don't finish. And yet it hasn't hurt us because we attract all these creative, talented young people that have got you know, undergraduate degrees or MBAs or you know, PhDs, mm-hmm. and they want to live here. And so what's happening, you know, 50 years ago when this country wasn't so mobile, it didn't matter so much. People would grow up, they'd get, get their high school degree, then they'd get their college education, they'd come back and live where, where, they, where they grew up. Uh, now, where everyone's so mobile, if you think about an economic incentive, some of the schools with the b- best higher ed systems are not able to retain a lot of their... Some of the states. Uh, yes, yeah, so, I'm yeah. sorry. Some of, the, some of the states with the best ed- higher education systems are losing all those graduates going other places. That's a significant investment of their tax money that's leaving their state. And I think that's a significant issue that the, you know, that the country has to kind of begin to come to grips with and say... It's not immediately apparent what the solution is. Right, right. I mean, it occurs to me, when we're looking at solutions across states, you know, the first answer that you had was that a, uh, you know, an extremely wealthy you know, oil magnate was, was donating a lot of his savings uh, uh, to higher education. Um, that's not something that every state can count on. That's, that's you know, rather... It, you work it is hard enough, but you can. Oh, no, I'm saying you can't... You, every that's state can't count on a system is based on accumulating wealth and then figuring out something to do... To not everyone, but most, many people. Oh, yeah, no, no, no question there. I'm saying not every state can count on a billionaire to bail out the state's public it's education true. system. That's true. Um, and you're fortunate in that respect. Uh, but other states aren't. So are there solutions outside of hoping that wealthy people we, will be more generous uh, to solving some of these, this public higher education crunch? Well, and then I went on to talk about trying to do it statewide. And part of that statewide effort is, is figuring out are there public resources that we can use that would uh, expand this, this scholarship approach so that it would be statewide? Because that does allow you to, to raise, and Colorado's b- way below average in, ter- in terms of state schools, uh, in terms of what we charge. doesn't mean our, our tuition should go up. You know, part of it, this, this is where I'll really get myself in trouble, is there's this, this, this arms race between our higher universities to see who can have the fanciest dormitory or the best athletic facilities. You look at the amount of capital expenditures that are going to, I mean, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but when I went to college, there were like four of us. 
with two little bedrooms. We had this little cubicle that they called a living room, mm -hmm. and we ate in a dormitory, and the food was, well, <laughs> you're eating lunch, so I'll be quiet. <laughs> but, but the bottom line is that's not go visit your, your, your family members now if they're in a, in a four-year institution and see the lifestyle. Even the public schools have excellent food, you know, very attractive living facilities, uh, athletic facilities that it would be the envy of any public high school. Uh, there's, and everyone's trying to keep up with each other, so they just keep raising the anti, the ante. Uh, that's, I mean, that's part of the issue. Right. You brought up college students, so here I'll transition to pot. Um, <laughs> you haven't uh, been vocally supportive of the passage of the legalization of. of uh, I beg your pardon. You ha have you have you been vocally supportive? No. Of, no. You. I, I oppose the passage of right. the of the legislation just because of. You know, and I've recognized that the war on drugs was a disaster, right? And we sent a lot of people to jail that had no business going to jail, and it was a real problem. But legalizing marijuana is, is, is going to have its own set of problems, which we're now realizing. Right. Well, so on that point, you know, you, you, when you were uh, a late office geologist, you founded a, a brewing company. Um, alcohol kills many more people every year than marijuana. And it's arguable that That's the only it. difference between marijuana and a similarly depressant drug is a federal classification, 75 right. so, years So ago. therefore, what you're saying is let's legalize marijuana and we can kill that many more people, right? <laughs> and that, you know, well, I mean, that's what you just said. I'm just trying to take the, your logic. <laughs> no, right. I mean, you, I mean you, you did choose, right, of all, of, all the, of all the things you could have started, you chose a brewing company, and I, I, I hope that it's because you, you love beer. Well, I, I, I will say that we charged half again more per beer than any of our competitors, so we were really encouraging people to drink far <laughs> you're, less you're and encourage it more. Against it. Okay. <laughs> if you believe in marketing. No, I, I, I mean, I'll kid around about it. Uh, I recognize that there are things I'm worried about, seriously worried about, with the legalization of marijuana. One is that, and we've got polls now that begin to demonstrate this, that the kids that are 14 and 16 and 18 years old, they think it's fine. And there are a great many top researchers that when, when young people's brains are still growing, the, the pot now is, is 10 times more potent, uh, 10 times higher concentration of THC than when I was a kid, right? And, and yes, I did smoke pot, and yes, I inhaled pot. But <laughs> th the bottom line is that if, if, with this high-potency pot, they are very worried that, that, that kids are going to lose forever some portion of their long-term memory, right? And kids are so young, they don't worry about it. And now they think it's harmless, and they're, we are really working, and we're actually going to go out and, and try and raise. I've gotten a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, raised, I'm going to try and raise two or three hundred more and really do an advertising campaign that points out some of the risks involved here. Uh, we did go through a legislative session, and no one's ever done this before, but you know, it will be driving under the influence. If they think you've been smoking pot uh, and you've been driving erratically, they will take you and have a blood test. We're going to, and we're going to, we will eventually get to the same regulations. You know, one thing, the, and the the, this incipient industry is resistant, but we will be every bit as restrictive as the alcohol industry is, right? When, when I applied to get a federal brewing license, you have to map out every square inch of your facility. You have to monitor every ounce you manufacture. If you throw it away, if it's not consumed, you've got you've to account for everything. We don't have anywhere near that level of regulation in medical marijuana. Right? Well, we're going to move to that level of rec uh, regulation as we go into recreational pot, and it's going to, I mean, it will take some real effort, but I don't see any other way to do it. Obviously, it's here to stay. I, w other companies are clearly going to follow this. Uh, it's, a, a, an, a, I think, a reflection of, of changing trends across the country. Uh, so I in that sense, I mean, uh, life goes on. Right. Uh, but... There's a lot to be done. Do you, do you see marijuana as a business opportunity? Or right now no, I'm, I'm happy being the governor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you get, get away with that because it was a good answer. Um, so, right, the last 18 months uh, of Colorado events have been pretty fraught. There was the tragedy in Aurora, the gun legislation, the backlash to the gun legislation. Uh, you granted recently a temporary uh, death penalty reprieve to a convicted murderer in May. And you've been harshly criticized um, in, in a poll that just came out. Um, you were running neck and neck with Tancredo, uh, which surprised a lot of people, I think not just in Colorado, um, but I was hearing the news in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a national uh, point. Um, you know, you're not elected to be a seismograph for public opinion. You're elected to lead and use your judgment. Uh, how do you do that when, when you're disagreed with, with so loudly on some of these issues? Well, I don't think we've done a very good job of communicating some of the issues. Uh, and the, uh, well, I'll take uh, universal background checks, right? right? The gun safety issues. So we were hammered. I think we lost 
10 points of, of approval rating based on that. Uh, and, and, and at one point after the shootings in Aurora, I talked to people all over the state, and pretty much everyone, Republican, Democrats, all thought, you know, for 10 bucks, a background check, when you, I, don't, I don't buy a gun that often. Sure, that's a good idea. Keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. So we got to the legislative session, and I couldn't get one Republican to co-sign the bill. And at a certain point, I said, I must be missing something, but let's get the facts, right? In the end, let's go back and get the facts. So we had public safety go back, and we get to about 50 or 55 percent of the gun purchases each year. Let's see what we found in 2012. So here are the facts. In 2012, just in, the, in Colorado, and these are numbers of, of people accused or convicted, but 90 percent of them have been convicted. So we had 38 people accused or convicted of homicide, tried to buy a gun. We had 133 people accused or convicted of sexual assault. 620 people accused or convicted of burglary. We had 1,300 people accused or convicted of felony assault. We had 420 people who had a judicial restraining order that they could not see their spouse or their, their, their partner, right? They tried to buy a gun. And, and all these people that kept telling me criminals aren't stupid, right? You're just making it inconvenient for us and you're trying to take our guns away from us. We had, in Colorado, in 2012, 236 people that when they showed up to b pick up their brand new gun, we arrested them for an outstanding warrant for violent crime, right? So 2,500 people that we stopped. Now, maybe they bought it somewhere else, but you can't argue that this doesn't work, right? That this isn't a significant benefit that for the cost, for 10 bucks per transaction, uh, doesn't dramatically reduce the number of guns in people's hands who, who shouldn't have them. How about, oh. <laughs> with the death penalty reprieve, could you walk through a bit of your thinking there? Sure. So we had a, a, a cold-blooded killer uh, who was 19 when he executed four people in a, in a pizza place uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, he'd been through all his appeals. Uh, and I, my whole life, I was always an eye for an eye person. Uh, actually, our very conservative archbishop was the first one who, you know, I said, well, I, my father was a Sunday school teacher. You know, I believe in the Bible, an eye for an eye. He goes, no, no, that's not what Christianity is about. That's, it's, it's, the New Testament is completely about forgiveness and redemption. And you're talking about the Old Testament. You know, get with the program. <laughs> um, but anyway, so we went back and we looked at this issue. And, and, and probably nothing got, uh, not that many people, but the people that were upset were some of my oldest friends, very, very upset about this. And the, the, the kid, without question, had severe bipolar disorder. So the way, and they, he went, they had him down in psychiatric observation at a ward down in, in Pueblo uh, for, for several weeks, and they, they monitor every 15 minutes. They see, they come in, are you awake, are you asleep, are you acting out, are you throwing things, are you frantic? Uh, and he would stay awake for two and a half to three days at a time. And the doctors tell me that you cannot masquerade that. You cannot pretend to be in an episode. You just physically can't stay awake for three days straight. Uh, unless you're really uh, severely bipolar. So that's a disability. It would not have made him innocent by any means, but we don't generally execute people that have disabilities, significant disabilities. And four of the jurors, three of them signed affidavits, said that if they'd known this, it, it likely would have made a difference in their decision whether the death penalty has to be unanimous. All 12 jurors have to go for it. So three or four of them. Then you have the, the, the parallel thing. Is it is it equitable, right? And there's a... Uh, a guy down in Canyon City in our prison who had escaped back two years before this, this cold-blooded killer that I was being asked to execute. And he caught four teenagers, tied them up, uh, tortured them, killed them all. Actually, he killed three of them. One of them is paraplegic for life. And that DA chose not to go for the death penalty, so he's in life in prison without parole. He's in a little cell. I mean, in many ways, I think a fate worse than death. Uh, but he's locked up forever. Why did he not get the death penalty? It's almost parallel crimes. So those are the reasons why, and I didn't think it was appropriate for me to overrule the people of Colorado because they haven't come around on this. So I gave uh, a reprieve. I said, as long as I'm you know, governor, I'm not going to uh, execute this guy. And then I spoke very openly about this guy's, the, 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 the families of the victims were about evenly d split, right? Half of them don't believe in the death penalty. Half of them desperately wanted closure. Well, when you do the research, a number of the people that want closure after the execution don't feel so good about it. The cost, we're at about $19 million of cost. Life in prison without parole is about two and a half, three million million, $3 million in present-day discounted costs. So we're spending six times more money. There's no deterrent value. I never knew that. I went to these, the, attorney, the district attorneys who were so adamant that we needed the death penalty, the states where they regularly execute people, 
right, Texas, Oklahoma, have no lower homicide rate, no lower incidence of, of heinous crimes, multiple killings, than the states that have outlawed it. And you begin to get a sense that this is where the, why the United States is the last developed country, right? No one in Europe, no one in South America, no, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, no one else is doing it. Israel, no death penalty anywhere except for us. And I think it's partly because we haven't gotten the facts. It, you know, there's a sense that it, it, it's justice and it's retribution, but the facts certainly don't support it. Yeah. That's a good answer, too. Uh, two more questions. I want to go back to the beginning um, a little bit, and I want to ask you what your experience as an entrepreneur uh, taught you about government then and how it's informed your time <laughs> in government now. And I wonder if, if you can, if you can reach back uh, uh, a couple decades and think what you thought, what your assumptions were about how government works when you were starting a company and fighting the red tape, and what you've learned about why you were wrong or why you were right. Well, certainly, and I was typical of a lot of people. I wasn't involved in government at all. I, I hated taxes. Uh, I was very, very r just, just repulsed by all the red tape and the bureaucracy that I had to deal with when I was starting the business and to operate the business. Uh, and I was very cynical of, of a lot of the elected officials. Not, I mean, I didn't know them, but people around my bars were, everybody was a bum. This person's a bum, that person's a bum. And that's part of why I ran, right? It was I kept saying to people, you know, this is the original experiment in democracy. And, and those of us who've done well have an obligation to go back and, and, and be part of government and infuse it with some of the, the lessons of, of, of the, the, the common sense of small business. And they'd all laugh at me and they said, you should do it, you should do it. And we had this thing over the naming rights of Mile High Stadium. And I, I was in the paper a couple of times and all these people came up and said, you've got to run for mayor. It's an open seat. And I was guaranteed that as long as I never did a negative ad, which I never have, uh, I would never win. I wouldn't have to worry about it, and I could kind of make a little crusade about people getting into government. So I entered it, <laughs> very cynical, and I will tell you that the one thing, the people that work in public service generally, now there are a lot of exceptions, but generally work very hard. They work more than 40 hours a week. They get very little credit, uh, and in many, many cases, they are true public servants in the, in the purest sense of the word. Uh, there are a lot of lessons they don't know, especially elected leaders. You know, I, I think every executive elected leader should spend at least a year running a big high volume restaurant. Because <laughs> you, learn, you learn right away when you're running a restaurant, there is no margin in having enemies. No matter how unreasonable that person is, you will go out of your way to make sure you have a relationship with them, right? Elected, all these elected officials, they love to put down the other guy because they think that lifts them up. They don't realize that there's gotta be a relationship down the road. They, it's all short term looking. The attack ads. I mean, one of the biggest problems with this country, and I mean this sincerely, is, 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 is the, the level of attack ads. And you never see Coca-Cola doing an attack ad against Pepsi, right? Because it would work. They're very effective. Pepsi's sa sales would go down, but Pepsi would have to do a counterattack against Coke. Coke's sales would go down. They'd do a counterattack. All of a sudden, you know, what happens is you, you end up diminishing the entire product, product category of soft drinks, which some of you would say is not a bad thing, right? <laughs> but... The, the real bottom line is what we're doing now is we're diminishing the product category of democracy, right? People are turning off their TV, switching the channel, and, and we should not accept that. Uh, diminishing the product category of politics sounds um, like something that would sound good in a national campaign. <laughs> and it occurs to me that when you type Hickenlooper into Google, the, au the first autocomplete is Hickenlooper 2016. So I want to ask you if you... Um, have any announcements you'd like to make um, <laughs> at so, this restaurant? So, so this, is, this is the power of the media where they can spend a good 30 or 40 minutes explaining all the things you've done that have made you so unpopular, right? <laughs> and diminish your, your attractability, your electability on, on every level between environmental communities and, and, and death penalty advocates and all those different components. And then suggest, but just in case, why don't you run for president? Uh, <laughs> I, I, think, I think the last six months, uh, probably more than anything else demonstrated that uh, that I am, I try to be apolitical, right? I've hired almost as many Republicans as I have Democrats. I try to make these decisions based on facts and evidence that it, wherever possible. You know, my son got into this fight uh, a couple of months ago where he said that he was complaining about homework. I said, oh, this is a glory years. He said, Daddy, you're, you're crazy. What do you do that's so hard every day? You, you make <laughs> decisions? He says, Daddy, get the facts, make a decision, check, next. I said, well, no, no. He goes, no, Daddy, get the facts, make a decision, check, next. Well, the, what we try to do is get the facts and get 
facts that everybody agrees to, and you know, then you try to, 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 to make decisions based on those facts and not on the politics, and you get hammered. It's, it's hard to imagine anyone like me, I'm, I'm amazed I got elected governor. We'll see what happens in the re-election. <laughs> I, I, we have no interest in, in, in running in 2016, just so we're absolutely clear. I was gonna so ask you if you were right, if there was any announcement uh, pro or negative. No. That was pretty, uh, pretty uh, concrete. Um, those are all the questions that I wrote down on my piece of paper. So we have, it looks like about 20 minutes is that, yeah? Uh, we're gonna open it up. Uh, we have some uh, mic runners and they're going to find you and um, you're gonna speak into them. I was trying to be it's more concise. Obviously I should have I, talked longer. Right, right. <laughs> right over there first. Hi, I'm Zachary Carabell. Um, so I've asked this question of a number of uh, extremely successful, charismatic, dynamic, local and state elected officials. Well, that leaves me out. Um, <laughs> I wasn't going to mention, I wasn't going to say anything about that comment, so we'll, we'll leave that <laughs> hanging. Um, which is, one, why do you believe that most of the creativity and nimbleness and responsiveness to actual needs takes place at best at the state level and usually at the mayoral level, uh, rather than ever at the federal level, which has not always been true, but it clearly would appear to be true. So why do you think that is? And does the, does the dysfunctionality of our, our federal system and its, its ability to respond meaningfully and creatively to challenges, you said you ran for office because you were so dismayed by people's dismissiveness of the officials locally, given how dismayed we are of our officials nationally, would that ever lead you to consider that? Or do you just <laughs> feel it's, it's an irredeemable process right now and not worth the time? Well, it's, it's certainly not irredeemable, and I think we've gone through cycles throughout the country's history of divisiveness and then coming back together again, divisiveness, uh, the, the partisanship rising. Unfortunately, most times that we come back together, it's either been a world war or a depression or something like that that helps bring the, sometimes both, uh, bring the country back together again. Uh, I think the, you know, the, the, the issues about local government mattering and, and, and having a responsibility and a closer relationship with their constituents is absolutely valid. Uh, and this part of the state's job is, as I tell people all the time, we want to be as, as, as strong partners as we can with our counties and our municipalities. And my first day, uh, right after the inauguration, I gave my inaugural address and I sat down and signed my first executive order which said we would not pass along any unfunded mandates or demands to our local governments and that we would do everything we can to be th their partners uh, as long as we get within the bounds of the state constitution. Uh, and I think that's the appropriate role of the federal government with the states, is that they shouldn't just be making you know, willy-nilly decisions. Now, in terms of the real dysfunctionality of, of the federal government, I think it is getting worse, clearly. And, and, and part of that is certain things, certain things have, uh, changes have been made that haven't been answered. One is the, the sunshine laws. So now, you know, when, when, uh, when the, the founding fathers really imagined this complex balance between the three arms of government, really what, one of the things Madison really believed in was the canceling out of the special interests, of the, of the self-interest, right? Think of lobbyists, right? Who go in there and they just have one thing that they need to perform on and then they get their paycheck, right? So what's happened when you have all the lobbyists and they get to see exactly how every congressperson votes on every funding measure, right? And it's all wide open. There's no way that those, those congressmen can survive if they take, uh, all they have to do is is, is, I was going to say piss off. Uh, well, I guess I did say piss off. Uh, <laughs> all they have to do is antagonize uh, one, uh, you know, or let's say four of these, of these powerful constituencies, and they'll, they'll get a primary. They, they'll quite likely get taken out. The, the, the power is immense. And in the old days, I, again, I, I believe in transparency. I think that government should be open. But I think those funding decisions, in the end, there is a value once you've elected your representatives, these are the best we have to let them make their decisions and, and trust they'll do it right and let them have some anonymity. So, uh, you know, in the old days, they'd come out of a meeting and say, you know, I am so sorry. I, I tried to get you your, your subsidy for your railroad. I really, you know, came close to getting this and, and I'll do better next time. Now, there's, the, everybody knows and you see that's part of what, and then you put into that these attack ads and the ability of, 
of companies to really spend enormous amounts of money uh, in, in the campaigns, it, it really does skew the, the, the entire system. Where's the mic? Uh, let's, one, I'm uh, sorry, yeah, one right here first. Governor, this is a fun question. Did you come up with the campaign commercial to uh, stand in the um, shower with <laughs> running water? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but I agreed to do it. I'm not sure which shows more of a lack of judgment. <laughs> no, that was, that was uh, uh, you know, the idea, I th and I'm not sure whether it was our, 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 our uh, you know, our, our media uh, director or whether it was a team effort, but the, I mean, the idea was to go keep getting into the shower in seven different changes of clothes, for those of you who haven't seen it, and then the voiceover says, every time I hear one of those attack ads, one of those negative ads, I just feel dirty, and I want to wash up. So there I am in my suit, washing soap on, uh, luckily I don't own many suits, but they're <laughs> old, so I could afford to lose a few. But anyway, thanks. Uh, let's come down here. We'll go right here. You can you can have questions for your whole co your whole table. Right. <laughs> uh, Gary Gerst from Illinois. I'm not sure I would wish this on anyone, but if those of us in Illinois could talk you into leaving Colorado, <laughs> 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 becoming governor of Illinois. Oh, thanks. To the extent that you're familiar with anything in that state. What would you do uh, when you became governor of Illinois? Oh, I, you know, I'm not sure I know enough about Illinois, although I do love the state, and I am a huge, you know, I, I'm dyslexic, so I'm a very slow reader, so I could never take a history class during college, and yet n I love history. So now that I can, it takes me literally two months, but when I read uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, uh, Team of Rivals, and so much of that is kind of talks about Illinois and, and where Illinois came from, uh, and it, it's, it's it just... Uh, it's totally engaging. And it made me think that if I was in Illinois today and I was in some, some form of public service, I would keep going back to the way things were 100 years ago and try to get people to, you know, to pick up the moral courage and the, the, the will to say, all right, we are going to be transparent. We're not going to do these backroom deals and, and we're going to kind of transform our, the expectations of our community. That's part of what all these challenges are is we have to figure out a way to get people to believe again, to believe in them, to believe in their community, to believe in their government, to believe in themselves. Uh, and I think that's a, uh, one of the things we've lost with attack ads and all this fallout from uh, negative politics. Go right there. My question about gerrymandering. <coughs> Do you share the view that uh, that is uh, one of the causes of our political dysfunction? Uh, what are the what is the situation in Colorado as far as uh, districting, voter districting goes? And uh, do you have any feelings about what the, if you think it is part of the problem, do you have any feelings about what the remedy might be? Well, I think it is a problem. It's less so here in, in, in our redistricting. You know, what I, of everyone I appointed, I got to appoint four people. Uh, the state senate appoints uh, one, the House points to, uh, there's a whole team of people that did this, that did the, the, the re-engineering of the maps. And my whole point was I wanted each district to be more competitive, right? To, to that's, as long as you make each district more competitive than it was before, then you're going to get more competitive races, people are more likely to vote, and you're going to get more moderate candidates instead of so many people on the extremes. And so many people, when they're in a safe seat, they can just go and, and please a small minority. So we're moving in the right direction, and we have, if you look at both Congress and our, our state uh, General Assembly, there are a lot of seats in play. I mean, there's, I think we have seven, seven Congress people, and I think you, it's fair to say that four, and even conceivably five of those seats are, are going to be in play consistently. What can you do about it? You know, I haven't seen the results on how it worked in California, but this kind of open primary where you can have ev both parties run in the same primary and the two highest vote getters are the two who run against each other, so you can end up with a moderate Republican and a very conservative Republican uh, in, the, in the same race, in the same runoff. Uh, at least intuitively, that sounds to me like something that would bring out, uh, again, uh, more reason. Uh, part of gerrymandering is a, a part of this, but I mean, one of the biggest problems is getting more people to, to, to run for public office or to serve in cabinets, right? I mean, we, th this whole book, Leadocracy, that Jeff Smart wrote, he was astounded. He's a, he wrote a book called Who? He's the best 
the best authority on how to hire people. He works for, he charges a fortune, he works for Fortune 500 companies, dozens and dozens, but he came and gave us a bunch of time. And when he saw the, the list of candidates we had for each of these cabinet positions, oftentimes there's only a couple of A-list candidates instead of four or five or six, which he thought we, we should expect. And you know, part of the reason is there's this, people think it's, it's partisan, people think it's dirty, they, they don't think you can get anything done, they don't think it's any fun. Uh, and that's part of what our leadership initiative is just, A, I mean, it's, I've had some pretty great jobs, right? I love being a geologist. I'd spend, you know, half my year over in the Rocky Mountains looking at some of the most beautiful landscapes on Earth. Uh, I then was in the brew pub business, which, you know, making great beer and making people happy and bringing people together and being around all these young people. I loved it. And yet, you know, being mayor and now governor are, by, by an order of magnitude, the best jobs I've ever had. You work with the smartest, most engaging people. You talk about serious issues that matter, and you are surrounded by, by talent of all different stripes. And, you know, somehow, beyond gerrymandering, we have to really focus on how do we get more people to, to serve in public service. That, that was actually my question. To, you said in August that you would launch the leadership initiative, I think you referred to it. I no, what's going on right now? Okay. Would you talk to maybe a little bit more about what is going on? And so we have... Uh, uh, depending on the day, but 10 or 12 CEOs, um, and some of them are, are large corporations or, or senior executives, so a couple of them aren't, aren't CEOs, but their commitment is we're gonna, they come in at once a quarter, and they come into my office and we have a, a, you know, a brown bag lunch, a sandwich and a salad or something, and, and we talk about exactly what it's like in the trenches being governor or being in the cabinet and the kinds of issues that come up, what your solutions are, what your resources are, uh, and, and we bring cabinet members in and try to find the ones that have come from private sector. Our chief information officer and secretary of technology in Colorado uh, is a woman named Kristen Russell, and she was a senior vice president of global IT services for Oracle, right? Oracle is the second largest software company in the world. She's, she's serious, right? She's, I think she was 38 years old or 39 years old. She wanted to take a few years off and give back, and, you know, she comes in and tells them, that she loves it, that this is something that has moved her in ways she didn't think were possible. She thinks she's prepared for a, 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 a job leap in a different direction that'll be something she couldn't have done without it. And so that's our goal, is to, is to provide the, the, the raw resources so that some of these very talented people from the private sector, or even who've been running you know, uh, universities or something, that they would consider pure public service. Maybe we could get some in this room. <laughs> well, that's why I keep bringing it up. Thank you. Let's go right there. Uh, thank you, Stan Kritzik from Wisconsin, the healthiest state. <laughs> <laughs> One of the healthiest states. You guys have too much bratwurst to be really the healthiest. <laughs> but we're also blessed with an abundance of water being on Lake Michigan, although the water has to stay in the basin. However, we don't have shale or natural gas. Now, Colorado, among other western states, is famous for, get, for water wars. What's going to happen with fracking when the fracking, which consumes large quantities of water, has to compete with all the other needs that you have? And that's happening right now. You have to keep it in perspective, right? So uh, last year, and, and I don't know whether we, I mean, we were, f the last several years, we fracked a great number of wells, over 4,000 wells. It's safe to say that every well that's been drilled for the last, almost the last decade, has used some form of hydraulic fracturing. Last year, we used less than half of 1% of all the water that was, that was used in Colorado for, uh, for fracking. So it's a very small amount. That does not mean it's not important, right? Because it is that incremental water that's coming out of generally some rancher or some farmer uh, who's leasing it or, or, or selling it. And I am a huge believer that, that our food production is, a, is, a, is, a, is, is part of our national security. And diminishing any water, taking away from farmers or ranchers, is something we should examine very, very closely. And, you know, I, I look at it, the, the bigger challenge, I think, is, is growing suburban communities with big bluegrass lawns. They're the ones who are really sucking up. I mean, the fracking is a fraction compared to suburban lawns. And... There is a, a, a challenge there that is, you know, immense, that, that somehow we have to create a culture of conservation, whether it's in fracking. You know, a lot of the, oil, the larger oil and gas companies are committed to totally closed-loop recycling uh, processes for their fracking, which will dramatically reduce the amount of water that they're, they're going to consume. Uh, 
we don't have, we haven't, we've had great success with some of our urban communities, but not with all of them. And I, you know, we've got a tremendous amount of Colorado's food is grown in Colorado, out on the Eastern Plains, and some of it even up in the mountains. Uh, and I think it's a, an imperative for, for the entire state to recognize that and protect the, the water that makes that, uh, that agricultural community uh, possible. The $40 billion a year uh, industry in Colorado is, is agriculture. Let's go towards the back of the room. Um, whoever's closest to you. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> one of the problems with beautiful Colorado right now are the wildfires which seem to be burning up our gorgeous forests. Uh, is there anything that the state can do to mitigate this problem? Well, there's some things we can try to do about the wildfires. I, this morning I flew down over uh, Pagosa Springs and, and South Fork, and, and it's, it's grim. When we w landed, we went in and uh, talked to the went to the incident command and, and just heard what the real facts are and they haven't lost a structure yet, but the the smoke down there and the, the it, it's just miserable. They've they've got a lot of people that have been out of their homes for I think a number of them on, on on for five days now. Uh, we can do a better job of of you know preparing the far the, trying to get more of the deadwood out of the forest, but we're talking millions of acres of beetle kill right. That is incredibly expensive to really expect the U.S. Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management to go in there and cull that much dead timber out of, out of the woods. It's it, 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 uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and, and even then, you're not completely, when we had the big fires last year, Waldo Canyon and High Park, the two big on the, on the kind of eastern part of the Front Range, uh, neither of them had, were fueled by uh, huge stands of dead timber. So that's not, it's not the only solution. Uh, one of the big issues is, is we, we learned from last year, so now we get local, when that local community, they're the first responders, when they can't handle it, they ask for state help and then federal help, an order of magnitude. What was, what was last year a matter of days is a matter of hours this year. And that's why we've had, I think, despite all the loss in the Black Forest, which was densely populated, uh, we've had more success. But we've also had a bunch of issues of people who are living in the wildland urban interface are unwilling to, they want wood shake roofs, right? Hey, the, you, if you're going to live out there, you can't have a wood shake roof and you, you shouldn't have a wooden deck up against your house, right? And, and clear back the, the, the large trees that are going to catch you know, blowing embers in a high wind event and, and, and back them off at least 30 feet. Some people would say 50 or 100 feet from your home. Get rid of the dense underbrush, right? Do what we call you know, defensible space because that will dramatically reduce the, the losses. That does not reduce the fires. And again, we're, this is, I, depends on how you feel about climate change. I, is this climate change? I don't know. I think it is. I, I'm not, I don't think the facts are there uh, incontrovertibly to say absolutely one way or the other. But I, I keep telling people, you know, I am awfully sure I'm not going to have an electrical fire in my house. I feel very secure about that. And yet, Every year, I buy insurance, right? My bank, my mortgage requires me to buy insurance, right? And you know, it's about it works out to about a half a percent, half of one percent each year that I pay on that. We, if even if there's a chance, right? Forget about the fact that ninety percent of the climate scientists are convinced this is happening; it's mankind's activities. Even if you put that to the side, we should be spending tens of billions of dollars a year, if not more, just as insurance to to safeguard our economy from some of the consequences and firefighting. I mean, we spent, it, it, just in the Black Forest fire, we spent about $10 million. And, and obviously, we, we saved hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homes. I mean, that, I'm not saying that money wasn't well spent, but it is an enormous cost that's going to go forward. And look at some of the coastal areas, what their uh, liabilities and, and vulnerabilities are. Uh, this, the, the drought and temperature uh, disruption is, is, has a poten a huge potential consequences. We have time for uh, one really quick uh, question <laughs> and uh, one really quick answer. Uh, so no pressure to either of you, but why don't we go right there. Th this should be a quick question. I, I grew up in Denver, so I'm a constituent, and, and once I was of legal age, a, a patron of the wind <laughs> Um I was out here on Monday and Tuesday for our national service summit, and uh, we're trying to call for universal national service, so everybody between 18 and 28 has to serve a year or more in a civilian or military capacity. And I'm wondering if you support that idea if you'd like to uh, make a commitment to, to do something like that in Colorado. You know, the, um, in the 30s, the CCC put three million people into the forest at a, at a cost-effective way to fight forest fires. So to follow up on that last question, that could be something that would 
be Im implemented in Colorado. So I'm curious for your take on that. Well, I, I, so I have long been a believer in public service, and I think uh, uh, some universal form of public service uh, helps break down some of the social barriers and, and allows us to, to, to come together on these difficult issues we've got to discuss uh, going forward. So I support that. Whether you can do it state by state, uh, I'd have to look into that and see what the, what the, the pros and the cons and what the consequences are, because there could be some unintended consequences there that, that I don't immediately see. On the surface, it seems fine. Sure. Governor, thank you very much. Everyone, thanks so much.